Hello, and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Chris Hudspeth, and I'm the radio program manager for MS Focus Radio. Uh, today, we're joined by Dr. Ben Thrower, who will be talking with us about bladder issues in MS. After the presentation, we'll open it up to your questions and comments. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Many people know him. He's Dr. Ben Thrower. He's the medical director of the Andrew, Andrew C. Carlos uh, MS Institute at Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Senior Medical Advisor to MS Focus. We're pleased to have him join us to present this important topic today. Dr. Thrower, thank you so much for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to all of the, the staff at MS Focus. You guys do an amazing job. I know you're under some challenges with the COVID pandemic, with having your kind of work schedules and probably home schedules disrupted. So just thank you to, to uh, all of you for what you do. And thank you to everyone for joining in uh, this afternoon. So I want to touch bases uh, today on a topic that it affects a lot of people with MS, and that's bladder issues in multiple sclerosis. We're going to take about 30 minutes to cover uh, some topics on, on bladder issues and then uh, throw it open to for some Q&A for about 15 minutes. Um, so when we think about the bladder, we should probably step back and say, well, what, what's all the hardware? What is the anatomy of the bladder? So upstream on this, this slide, you've got the kidneys, and so the kidneys are going to produce urine. It's going to flow down some little tubes, one on each side called the ureters, and it's going to, that urine is gonna drop into a muscular bag, which is what the bladder is, called the detrusor muscle, which is, is that's, that is what the, the, the bladder muscle or sac is. And that, that when we want to empty that, that sac is going to squeeze and the valves down below are hopefully going to open up so that you have this coordinated squeeze, valve opens, bladder empties. So uh, that's the way all of this anatomy should work. The typically as the bladder starts filling up, that the, the bladder is going to send a message to, via the spinal, uh, via the nerves to the spinal cord to say, hey, I'm filling up you probably should find a restroom right now, that the brain is going to kind of put in its two cents worth, if you will, and tell the, the, the bladder, hey, I know I'm getting a message from the spinal cord that says you're getting full and you better empty, but we're not to a bathroom yet, you better wait. And so the brain has an inhibitory influence over what the spinal cord wants to do. Um, when, you're, when it's time to go, then the, the, the brain says, okay, spinal cord, do your thing, send the message to the bladder, tell that detrusor muscle to squeeze, the valves are gonna open, and the, the urine's going to, to uh, come out at the appropriate time. So a couple of different terms that I'll throw out to you, that, and this is kind of uh, academic, but te technically there is a, different, a, a difference between urination and micturation. We all, when we pee, we typically say we're going to urinate. Technically, that's not correct. The act of peeing is micturation. When the, when the urine flows from the kidney down the ureters to the bladder, that's actually urination. So if you want to impress your, your uh, friends, relatives, and dinner guests, you can tell them the difference between urination and micturation. It's also to import, important to know who are the different healthcare providers who work with this problem. And although we sound alike, there is a difference between neurologists and urologists. Urologists are the drains, we're the brains. So, so we get the upstream, they, they, they get the downstream. So there's another term that's important, call, important called post-void residual or PVR. Post void residual is how much urine is left in your bladder after you think you've emptied it completely. Ideally, there really shouldn't be much of anything in there, but the line in the sand that you're going to see come up again and again today is 100 mLs of urine. That's the magic number, as to, and that's going to help determine which treatment pathway we go down uh, if we're dealing with bladder issues. So post void residual. So this kind of puts all of that together. So this is a little, a little cartoon of the bladder filling up with urine. It's a signals going to the spinal cord saying, hey, I'm filling up. 
if it's the appropriate time, the brain is going to say, okay, it's all right to go. It's going to send a, a signal back to the spinal cord, uh, down uh, the nerve roots to say, okay, now let's open the valve, let's squeeze the muscle, and let's empty the urine. Because of the demyelination and the nerve fiber damage that we see with multiple sclerosis, it's not unusual to see bladder issues with MS. There are a lot of different areas where MS could throw a monkey wrench into this normal function. Bladder issues are very common in MS. They're reported in, in 75 to 97 percent of uh, people with multiple sclerosis and sometimes they can go along with bowel issues and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, focus on bowel at, a, at another time but sometimes those things can go hand in hand. NARCOMS, the North American Research Committee on MS, did a survey, and what they found in their survey was that 65% of people with MS reported at least one bladder issue, and that the bladder issues were strongly associated with a decrease in quality of life. They really impacted what, uh, what people could do, being able to go out to the store, uh, just, just so many different areas that these bladder issues were affecting in quality of life. Um, and Unfortunately, although the bladder symptoms were common, um, only about 43% of the time uh, were people being referred to a urologist for help with their bladder issues, and only in about half of the appropriate patients were they being offered a medication, and we'll talk about these anticholinergic therapies. Uh, so there, it does appear that, that as healthcare providers, we're probably not uh, doing as great of a job as we could in terms of, of offering people treatment avenues. So there are three things that MS can do to the bladder in general, and we're going to uh, kind of break these down and talk about them. There is an inability to empty the bladder, and this, so this is a large underactive bladder. So this person has a post void residual of greater than 100 cc's. There's an inability to store. So this is a small bladder uh, that is typically overactive. So it's, it's filling up and wanting to go. So this is a post void residual of under 100 cc's. And then either one of these or by itself as a separate problem, uh, we can see a third issue called dis, uh, detrusor sphincter dysinergia. And we'll, t we'll spend some time talking about that as well. So, it's, so we've, we've talked about this 100 cc's or 100 mls of urine as being an important sort of uh, fork in the road. And th it really is something that we use to help d uh, send people down different pathways. Uh, in the past, we would tend to determine that uh, by using uh, an, it, a straight catheter. So we would have the person go to the restroom, have them try to empty their bladder, and then uh, the nurse would do a, an intermittent catheterization to see how much was still in there. Fortunately, now we have something that's a little bit easier, uh, the bladder scan. So the, with the bladder scan, we're going to use ultrasound to determine how much urine is in the bladder. So again, same idea. Go to the restroom, you try to empty completely. Once you think things are empty, we're going to have the nurse take a picture with ultrasound, see how much is in there, completely non-invasive. I'm going to mention just a couple of other tools that we have uh, to, to help sort out what's going on with someone's bladder. There are urodynamic studies. So urodynamic studies would be done through a urologist. This is where we're going to, we would have a catheter inserted. We're going to put sterile water into the bladder and, and actually record the pressures of the detrusor muscle. So how much urine is in the bladder before you can actually detect it and how strong are those detrusor muscle contractions? You know, are you someone that when you fill up a little bit, are you having to go right away and you're having uninhibited detrusor contractions, the got to go right now issue? Or are you someone who can't tell that there's a lot of urine in there and those, that muscle's not squeezing at all so that that's the large underactive bladder? Cystoscopy, uh, this is, is so cystoscopy is actually taking a look with a scope inside the bladder. So this would not be something we would do specifically for MS, but it may be something that, that a urologist still wants to do to rule out other problems that might be contributing to bladder symptoms in a person with MS. So the inability to store, uh, this is the small uh, um, 
un, small overactive bladder. This is probably the most common uh, form of bladder dysfunction that we see in MS. So this is the literally the gotta go, gotta go. Uh, you feel like there's a gallon of urine in your bladder. You go, there's a very small volume. 30 minutes later, you're doing the same thing all over again. When we do your post void residual, it's going to be under 100 mLs of urine, uh, not much there. You can have some incontinence with this occasionally if that bladder, that detrusor is really squeezing and you, you just may not get there on time. There's a cruel uh, symptom that we see in a lot of people with MS that as they, that as they start experiencing this urgency that, man, I've got to go, the closer to the bathroom they get, the worse it gets. And sometimes people will have accidents literally right outside of the bathroom door when they were almost there. So some of the things that we do to treat this small overactive bladder, um, limiting fluid intake at certain times. We, one of the, the messages we want, really want to get hit home uh, to people with MS when they're dealing with bladder issues is we don't want you to be dehydrated. Limiting your fluid intake all of the time as a treatment strategy is not a good way of managing your bladder. You'll get constipated, you'll be dizzy, you'll be tired. Um, so, but limiting your fluid intake just at certain times. If you know you're getting in the car to go somewhere, if you know you're gonna get on a plane, sometimes limiting your fluid intake just before bedtime uh, so maybe if you go to bed at 10, so say you know, for three hours ahead of bedtime, cutting back on your fluid intake so that you're not having to get up through the night quite as, as often. Um, knowing where the bathrooms are, taking bathroom breaks. Uh, you know, sometimes that means working with your employer to, to say, listen, I've got to have a bathroom break every hour uh, at least uh, uh, to, to uh, make life bearable. Uh, being close to the bathroom in your workplace. If you need using pads or protective garments, just in case there is a, a, an, an accident. We need to be aware of bladder irritants, things that would, would really take that small overactive bladder and sort of poke it a little bit more. So caffeine, alcohol, aspartame. Aspartame is NutraSweet. I always tell folks, if you want to create the perfect storm for making your bladder very unhappy and, and making you have to pee very quickly, have a rum and Diet Coke. You've got the alcohol, you've got the caffeine, you've got the aspartame all in one place. And surprisingly, you'll see people do this on planes, which adds that fourth dimension of maybe not being able to get to the bathroom when you're, uh, when you're in flight. Traditionally, we're gonna use anticholinergic medicines and we'll talk about those in a second. DDAVP is an old school drug that we pull out of the hat to maybe get people through the night without having to, to go to the bathroom. It tells your kidneys to back off on urine production uh, so that maybe you can get through the night without having to get up as often. And then Botox we'll talk a little bit about in terms of where that might fit in. So you have several different anticholinergic medications. These are all uh, oral medications with the exception of one of these. There's actually a, a patch uh, that you can use, but most of these are pills. The, the patch is the Oxytrol uh, medication. So um, all of these work on uh, acetylcholine receptors. The um, challenge with, I'm going to skip back here for a second. The challenge with acetylcholine receptors is they're not just present in the bladder, and that's going to have impacts on, on some of the side effect risk with these drugs. So what we would like these drugs to do is increase your bladder capacity, let you fill up more before uh, having to go, diminish the frequency of incontinence episodes, and really get, delay that initial strong urge of got to be there right away. The downside to these anticholinergic drugs, again, is that those receptors, those acetylcholine receptors are not just present in your bladder, they're in lots of places. Uh, they're in your salivary glands, so you can get a dry mouth. They're in your gut, so you can get constipation. They're in uh, some of the muscles that control the like, contraction of your pupil, so you can see blurred vision. And they're also present in the brain, so some people can be sensitive and have drowsiness from these medications. Um, there, is a, there is one newer option. It's a non 
cholinergic drug. It works on a different chemical pathway called uh, muscarinic pathways, and it's a drug called uh, Merbetric. You'll see commercials for it. Uh, tends to have a lower side effect risk. In a perfect world, we might pick this as our first option for everybody. Insurance companies don't like us to have a perfect world, so they may want you to go through the, a couple of the anticholinergic drugs first before they're going to uh, approve payment for, for this drug because it is a little pricier. Um, what about cannabis in the bladder? So there is interesting uh, data out there uh, looking at the use of CBD THC capsules or sprays and there have been studies showing that there can be improvements in overactive bladder symptoms. So it turns out that our bladder does have uh, uh, endocannabinoid uh, receptors that where uh, CBD and THC may potentially work, and so that we do sometimes see a decrease in bladder uh, spasms, urgency, frequency, and incontinence with uh, CBD THC products. So Botox can be also be used as a treatment option. And what this would be done through a urologist. They're going to do a cystoscopy. They're going to use that little scope and go in and do a sort of little tiny injections of Botox throughout that detrusor muscle uh, to try to have things quiet down a little bit. This is typically uh, going to last you for three months, four months of a time, and then you would go back in and have this done, done again. So what about the inability to empty? So this is the large underactive bladder. And on the picture, I have a, a photo of, of a glass being filled with water and it's just overflowing. And so that's the way that the bladder works with the underactive bladder. It fills up and, and the urine just overflows. Um, you can have this, the, the sphincter dysinergia or a, a valve that's not opening well with this problem. Even though the, the, in general, the bladder is not emptying well, surprisingly, you still can have frequency and urgency. The bladder can still spasm and twitch. It's just not doing a very effective job in actually emptying uh, the, uh, the um, urine. Um, there are some things that we worry about with, uh, with this. There, so urinary tract infections are one of the things we see as a, as a side effect of the inability to empty because that urine is always sitting there. It's a perfect culture plate for uh, bacteria to grow in. And again, post void residual greater than 100 cc's. Um, so again, the urine sitting there can be a, a, a site for bacteria to grow. We see urinary tract infections uh, commonly. And over time, that pressure of the urine sitting in the bladder and not emptying can backflow up, up the ureters to the kidneys, and you can actually end up with some kidney damage uh, as a secondary result of a bladder that doesn't empty very well. Um, this, this is a little more challenging to treat than the small underactive bladder. We frequently get urologists involved with this. We uh, do bladder training. We try to get people set up with structured timed voidings to try to maybe retrain that muscle to contract. This may be a person that requires intermittent self-catheterization. So if, if the bladder doesn't want to empty, we may need to do something to mechanically empty it. And this would be the, the small picture of the catheter there on the, on the, the bottom. Um, we sometimes use alpha blocking agents. These are drugs like Flomax, which was a drug, or Tamsulosin, which was a drug designed to use to treat prostatic hypertrophy in men. But what we're trying to do in men and women with MS who have a, a bladder that doesn't want to empty is we're trying to increase the ability of the, of the, 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 the uh, outflow, the urethra, to stay open and let that urine flow out. Uh, some of our antispasticity drugs, our baclofens and tizanidines, will sometimes help a little bit with relaxing the sphincter. And just like with the small underact, or small overactive bladder, we use DDABP at bedtime as a pill to just tell the, the kidneys to back off on urine production so maybe you get a better night's sleep. Medtronic's interstem device. So if with MS we have disconnected the brain and spinal cord from the bladder, what if we could just tell the bladder to work through an, a sort of an external device, if you will. So we're rewiring the bladder 
using this electrical device. It's like a pacemaker for your bladder. So you're surgically implanting this Medtronic interstem device about the size of a hockey puck under the skin of your, on your flank and then using microelectrodes that would tap into those nerve roots and just having a small continuous electrical signal flowing to the, through those nerve roots to the bladder to tell the bladder to empty or to override that, uh, that sort of uh, the, the bladder spasms. This is also sometimes interestingly used in fecal incontinence. Uh, uh, so I've, I've not had as much experience with that. Most of our folks that have interstem devices uh, are using them for bladder symptoms. And again, that would, you'd wanna have that through a, uh, done through a urologist who's very familiar working with these devices. There is a trial device that they can uh, put in first so you're not committing to the, uh, to the, the, the full surgery and uh, um, expense of that permanent device. And with the trial device, you should get a sense of what the permanent device is going to be like and what results you would get. So another way of mechanically emptying the bladder is a suprapubic catheter. So this is a minor outpatient surgical procedure uh, just under the belly button. This uh, catheter would be inserted uh, into the bladder. So you'd have a small tube, if you will, just under the belly button that could be hooked up to a, 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 another piece of tubing and a drainage bag so that you're emptying the bladder uh, through, through this mechanism. And then so other things um, that we want to think about is, is again, don't become dehydrated. Um, you can limit fluid intake in limited situations, again, like bedtime, plane trips, car rides. And we may need to think about uh, trying to help the bladder empty through catheterization or a suprapubic catheter so that we don't end up with UTIs uh, and they help keep those kidneys healthy. So the last one is the detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. So remember in that cartoon how we showed that when the muscle squeezes, the valve should open down here. So squeeze, open. What happens with bladder dyssynergia is you're squeezing, 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 and the valve's not opening downstream. So this is the I gotta go, but I can't go situation. So you're, you're in the bathroom, you're sitting there, you know there's urine uh, in the bladder, and you can't P. Um, so this is because of in coordination between the valve and the muscle itself. So what does this look like in the real world? So in the clinic, if you come in with bladder symptoms, uh, the, one of the first things we always want to think about is ruling out a UTI. For a lot of people with MS, their UTI symptoms may actually be neurological and not urological. So for some people, their UTI symptom is going to be increased spasticity or weakness. So we always want to have a very open mind to looking for UTIs. We also have to realize that just because there's, there are bacteria in the bladder, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's a full-blown infection. Some people with MS who have an underactive bladder are colonized with bacteria. They will always have some bacteria in their, in their urine, in their bladder, and it may not be an outright infection. That's a very fine line sorting out what's colonization and what's, what's an actual infection. Usually the rule is if it's an infection, you're gonna have, have white blood cells, evidence of an inflammatory response in addition to those bacteria. We also have to be careful when we do uh, urine samples that we've got a clean catch, that we haven't got bacteria from the skin in that urine sample. One of the ways that we determine that is by looking for epithelial or skin cells in the urine sample. If we see a whole bunch of skin cells in your urine sample, we really don't know what to do with that. That's a dirty sample and we probably need to get a better sample because that any bacteria that are present may actually be from the skin and not from the, the bladder itself. We do the bladder scan then to rule out, to, to again, to point you down that, you know, under 100 cc's versus uh, over 100 cc's. Consider DD AVP for, for the, the nighttime symptoms. So let's kind of circle back to the urinary tract infections for a moment. And again, we, we really can't, uh, you know, overemphasize how important those are. Um, those UTIs 
frequently can cause pseudo exacerbations or pseudo relapses. So worsening of neurological function that's not due to a new lesion, it's due to an infection. Any infection can do that, upper respiratory infection. Uh, but the most common one to do it would be a urinary tract infection. So how do we uh, prevent you know, UTIs? We have to think about kind of what, what the steps are in a, in a UTI, realizing again, a lot of people have bacteria in their urine, but they don't have an actual UTI. For, for an infection to occur, that bacteria has to bind to the wall of the bladder. Um, and if it, once that bacteria sort of binds to the wall of the bladder, you can't pee out those bacteria now, so you can't flush them from the system. E. coli is a common bacteria to cause urinary tract infections, and E. coli has two ways, two receptors, if you will, on its surface that it can use like little grappling hooks to stick to the bladder wall. There's something called a P pili, pardon the pun, uh, and then a type 1 pili. These are the two anchors that E. coli can use to stick to the bladder wall. So some of the simple things that we can think about that might lower the risk of a urinary tract infection would be preventing the ability of E. coli to use their grappling hooks to stick to your bladder wall. One of the things that we uh, can use is D-mannose. D-mannose is a simple sugar. It's not actually absorbed, so we, we can use it safely, say in someone with diabetes. But what it does is it binds to that type one uh, pili, and it doesn't let the E. coli bacteria use that grappling hook to stick to your bladder wall. So in a study of 308 women who were having recurrent urinary tract infections, if they gave them two grams of D-mannose daily, it was actually more effective than putting people on a daily antibiotic in preventing urinary tract infections. Uh, D-mannose is simple, it's over the counter, it has you know, almost no side effect risk uh, whatsoever. What about cranberries for UTI uh, prevention? Uh, so cranberries have, uh, have a chemical PACs or, or proanthocyanidans uh, uh, that may also help block the ability of E. coli to use uh, one of those, those receptors. So it actually attacks the other uh, 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 receptor, the, it attacks the P pili. Um, 36 to 72 uh, milligrams a day of, the, of these PAC, PACs appears to be the best dose. There are, there are a lot of different cranberry extracts out there. They're not all created the same. And so I would say if you're going this route, I would spend a little bit of extra money and look at one of these uh, that's on the bottom, Elura, Utiva, Theracran, or, or uh, Cranberex. Uh, we use a lot of the first one, the Elura. It's not cheap. It's about 50 bucks a month. Um, all of them are in the same price range, but if you think about the person who's having to go to the emergency room, you know, once every couple of months for a UTI and experiencing worsening of neurological symptoms or hospitalizations, I think it's, it's money well spent. So we do have to uh, realize that, that there are uh, people that we might not be able to use the cranberry uh, extracts in. So some of these products do uh, actually contain uh, salicylic acid and aspirin-like products. So if you're allergic to aspirin, you, might, you could in theory have an allergic reaction to some of these cranberry products. And then they also contain oxalates. Uh, if you have kidney stones, we have to be a little cautious about using cranberry products because they could, in theory, increase your risk of kidney stones. And then uh, low doses of uh, daily doses of antibiotics to prevent UTIs. This is something we do. We, we want to be cautious. We don't want to create bacterial resistance to an antibiotic that maybe we need later. So we tend to pick some of our older antibiotics, uh, things like Macrobit or nitrofurantoin or septra bactrim on a, in a low daily dose to help prevent the UTIs. And then finally, there is a, an over-the-counter product that maybe some of you have used or have heard of called Azo. It's important to know what that does and what it doesn't do. 
azo is purely to prevent, to, to help lessen the likelihood of pain with a urinary tract infection. It's important to know it doesn't treat the UTI, it doesn't kill bacteria, it doesn't prevent UTIs. It's just to make you more comfortable if you do have a UTI. It's fine to use it, but just know what, it, what its limitations are. And I think with that, I am gonna turn it over to, to you folks and see what questions or thoughts you have. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thrower. We do, um, uh, we are ready for questions. And if you have a question or a comment, please use the raise your hand feature uh, in the app or send your questions via chat. So to raise your hand, click the screen to pull up the menu, uh, select more, the icon with the three dots, and then click raise hand. I'll unmute you, then a button will appear on your screen asking if you want uh, to allow me to do uh, to do that. So if you want to go ahead and select now, you can do that. We do have some questions uh, starting out that were emailed. Uh, first one is, uh, fatigue is my biggest MS symptom, and I found that caffeine is the best remedy for the fatigue. Even if I take caffeine by drinking an additional cup of coffee in the morning, I find that I have urgent bladder issues later that night. In the past, I've been recommended a product pre-lift, I believe is the pronunciation. Uh, to reduce acidity, but now that doesn't even seem to work for this nighttime overactive bladder. Yeah, that's that's a tough one because again, caffeine is one of those big three bladder irritants, and and it can have a long lasting effect on on bladder spasms and causing urgency and frequency. You know, we'll see people again with caffeine, you know, in the form of coffee or a soft drink that will say, "Man, I, I had that hours ago, and I'm still." having to, to pee all night long. Um, I would, you know, if you're using the caffeine to manage fatigue, I think the key there is, is you're gonna probably have to look at another fatigue uh, treatment option. There are lots of other things out there. Uh, we, we, have, we have whole programs, I think we've done for MS Focus on just fatigue. So simple things like a, a acetylcarnitine over the counter, a gram a day is simple. In, an, in about 40% of people, it'll give you a nice energy boost. Uh, acetylcarnitine, 1,000 milligrams. Uh, try it for a month. Then you kind of get up into the prescription drugs from amantadine to uh, modafinil, provigil, armodafinil, which is new vigil, stimulant drugs. So we have a lot of other treatment options. Uh, yeah, I get it. People need fatigue is a big, big problem in MS. But it, you know, if you've got bladder issues, uh, ca the caffeine may not be your best friend. Okay, another question is from Deborah. Uh, can you suggest any behavioral strategies to help empty the bladder? So it, it's gonna, going to really depend on what bladder issue you're dealing with. So if again, if you've got, if you're having trouble emptying the bladder if there is some of that bladder dyssynergia, so the valve doesn't want to open. Um, so kind of putting pressure on the bladder when you're sitting on the toilet is one way to help get that valve to open. So you can either sort of push from above gently on the top of the bladder to try to get that valve to open so that you can, can pee. You can bend over and treat yourself kind of like a tube of toothpaste to kind of squeeze a little bit and put pressure on the bladder. Or if that's not comfortable, you can also put a little uh, step stool, if you will, if you could find a stool that has an angle to it so that you can bring your feet up and put that, put your feet on the stool, that's going to also put pressure on the bladder and help that sphincter release. Um, there are, um, in most urology clinics or even in MS clinics, we, we sometimes have bladder specialists. So, you know, nurses who spend a lot of time, you know, training people in different techniques, whether it's, it's those pressure techniques or you know, ways of, of sort of timing your, your fluid intake. But those, those are a couple of ideas. All right, um, a next, que uh, next question is from Shannon. Shannon, I'm gonna unmute uh, your microphone and uh, you can ask your question. All right, that does not seem to want to cooperate. Uh -oh. Oh, there we are. Shannon, are you there? <laughs> okay, we'll try another one. We have right. some technical issues here. Um, are there any strategies that can help people with sphincter problems uh, fully empty the bladder? 
you know, so if that, again, if that, if that valve is not opening the way that it should, uh, some of those uh, alpha adrenergic medications like the Flomax, Tamsulosin may help uh, you know, open that valve up so that you can empty more effectively. Um, the, we mentioned Botox for the, the detrusor muscle. Botox is sometimes done for the sphincter itself also to try to help it relax a little bit. And then, uh, you know, if we're just not able to empty the bladder in spite of behavioral changes, uh, and, and back, going back for a second on the behavior, I should have mentioned uh, pelvic floor strengthening through physical therapy is another kind of behavioral uh, rehab method that we can look at. Um, if we're not able to get that bladder consistently emptied between the medications, the, the you know, Botox, different strategies, that may, we may need to think about some sort of you know, mechanical uh, emptying, whether it's intermittent self-catheterization, suprapubic catheter, uh, or something along those lines. Okay, we're going to try Shannon again. Uh, see if I'll send you an unmute request. And Shannon, if you can unmute, you'll be able, there you go, you can ask your question. Hi, I'm currently on Nervetric and Dectrol, and I have been for some time. Is there any long-term effects on my kidneys taking those medications? Yeah, good, good question. So we, so both of those medications are working on your bladder and not on your kidneys. So we really don't see any, any long-term problems with, with those medications. Again, the Detrol is working on those acetylcholine receptors on your bladder. Your Rubetrix working on the, the muscarinic receptors on your bladder, just trying to get your bladder to relax a little bit. Obviously, if you are ever on those, one of those medications and you find that you can't pee, so you know, you've gone hours and hours and hours, that means the medication's working too well. It's unusual to see that ha happen, but if, you, if you're just starting one of these types of medications for the first time and you find that you can't empty the bladder, that means we've, we've gone too far, we've pushed too hard. So that, that you don't wanna let that go for hours. You wanna contact your healthcare provider, let them know that that's happened. But, but really, we don't see any long-term effects on the um, kidney from any of these medications. And a uh, question from uh, the group chat. Uh, can you have a UTI without symptoms? So typically, if you have a UTI, you're either going to have a urological symptom or a neurological symptom. Um, so either your old, you know, your fatigue is going to worsen, your your gait's gonna worsen, your spasticity's gonna worsen. Sometimes it's cognition. Some people get confused when they have a UTI or you're gonna have frequency, urgency, burning. You know, if it gets to the point that you've got fever and things like that, that's a bad UTI. Once in a while, we catch UTIs early. People say, maybe there's a little something and we look and there are a few bacteria and a few white blood cells, but it's pretty rare for someone to have a completely asymptomatic UTI in, in MS. Okay, our next question is from Joanne Fortunato. Joanne, I'm gonna unmute you uh, so you can ask your question. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Um, I write articles for the MS Focus Magazine on how to use technology to help you with MS. And I'm wondering if you know of any apps that would be good for tracking your symptoms and, and managing, like, you know, making sure you go regularly and keeping track of your water or, or if there's any way, because it's hard to, you know, you forget how to keep track of stuff. That's a great question. And, and, and I'll be very honest. I don't know of anything. That doesn't mean it's not there. Um, you know, maybe what we can do is... Um, yeah, we'll do some research on that. And so, Chris, what would be the best way to get that? Inf I mean, we can certainly put something in the magazine uh, when it comes out or on the website. But yeah, I don't. Maybe we'll you know, sort of circle back and uh, find out some way of getting. It. I, I don't know of it. I know we can put timers on your phone, obviously, that are not MS specific, but just say, "Hey, pee, go go pee now," or "You need to drink water right now." And so I take, that's, you know, basic technology, but I don't know of an app that's specific for, for what you're thinking of. Uh, let me unmute you again. You say, oh, you know, yesterday I went so many times and I drank so much water. I mean, keeping track and having that, that record of everything that you do 
would be helpful too, because you could then take that to your urologist and say, this is what's going on. Absolutely. I, I agree. So, I mean, I guess you could, we could always just do notes in the, you know, on your phone, just dictate yourself a, a note. But I think like you said, some reminders to, to get those notes in. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll look into that. I, I'm not aware of it right off hand. I'm in ironically, in here. Um, issue, ironically, the next issue of the um, MS focus, the theme is bowel and bladder issues. Ironically. Oh, perfect. perfect timing. Yeah, that's why one of the reasons that I'm listening in. Well, yeah. thank you for what you do for the, for the magazine. We appreciate you. I'm going to chime in here just for a moment and say, Dr. Ben, if you ask around and you find anything, if you'll get that information to me, I will get it to Joanne, and she uh, tests out and reviews these apps and then writes about it for the magazine, and that's awesome. how we can distribute that information. So I do let it. us know if you hear of anything. Got it. And I'll check with our urology department also, see if they know of anything. Thanks. Thank you so much. We have about five minutes left, and let me see if we have, um, all right, uh, another question. Do bladder issues affect other organs? So the, if your bladder is not emptying, it can affect your kidneys. Uh, so that's the most direct link. Um, that would be the, the most common thing. Obviously, if you have urosepsis, if you have a severe enough infection that you're, you've got bacteria in the bloodstream, that's, that's a big issue. So you can have your blood pressure drop uh, and have other effects on organs. That, that fortunately is, is rare that someone's going to become that septic. So the most common one we really need to watch for is just the, the effect on the kidney, and that, that's called hydronephrosis. If that back pressure from the bladder is reflected up to the kidney, it can cause this, this uh, damage to the kidney called hydronephrosis. Uh, there is a, uh, something in chat here uh, about um, the, the question Joanne had. Uh, there's an app called Bladder Diary you can download cool. from Android. Awesome. Yeah, so um, I learned something. Yeah, so that is um, that. So, and Jerry also has a question: Why do I have kidney pain throbbing when I when taking AZO? Azo? Azo. Um, I mean, I've seen that listed as, as a rare side effect. Um, I, you know, if you if you're getting flank pain with Azo, I mean, I. I, I probably wouldn't take it anymore. I don't know that I know the exact mechanism of why that happens. It's rare, but I probably would, would stop it. Okay. We have uh, another question coming in from Lisa. Um, who, Lisa, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. If you would just click uh, to allow me to unmute you, then you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, we'll try again in just a moment. Um, another question from Betty. Uh, I use Ves Vesicare, Vesicare for uh, bladder urgency and frequency. I use it only on days of travel or time when facilities are lacking. Is there any other better way to cope with this issue? So if you're, if you're doing it by the books, really all of those anticholinergic drugs, Vesicare and uh, Detrol, Deodetrin, they really should be used as maintenance medications. Uh, so they should be taken on a daily basis to get the best bang for the buck with them. Um, I have people who do what you're doing. They take it just on an as-needed basis and they get away with it. And I get the appeal to doing that of not having to take a medication every day. But if you really want to see the full benefit of the drug, I would suggest looking at it on a daily basis. Okay, uh, another question from Christina in chat. Uh, when I get nervous, I pee a lot. What can I do? So that's, so don't get nervous. Um, but unfortunately, it, we all get nervous and, and, you know, that's just part of the human experience. So there are, you know, so doing pelvic floor strengthening exercises or, you know, kegels, if it's a, if it's a sphincter problem, Sometimes that can help strengthen uh, that valve a little bit so that maybe you have more control. Um, it sounds like you probably have a small overactive bladder and anxiety will sometimes worsen that. So you might look at you know, some of the medications we talked about. If you know you're going to be in a, in a situation that produces anxiety, maybe cutting back on your fluid intake about three hours ahead of that, that time would all be some, some uh, potential uh, thoughts. 
Okay, just a few minutes left. Uh, Lisa, we're going to try again to unmute you. And yeah, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, my error. Um, as we age, I am about to turn 67 um, and possibly gain weight. I've gained a lot of weight. Oh my gosh. Can this affect our bladder problems? Um, so, you know, as we, as we age, it's like, what is this? Is this regular aging or is this MS? So there are a lot of, they, it can, and there are a lot of different ways that, that might happen. So just the, the mechanics of, of carrying more weight could put a little bit more pressure and, and maybe exacerbate a, a small overactive bladder just by making you have to go more often. Um, the, you know, as we age and sometimes we decondition some, so our pelvic floor can weaken just like any other muscle. So those, you know, those pelvic floor strengthening exercises like Kegels uh, might be a way of pushing back on that. And then a, an area that's really just evolving right now is the whole concept of neural reserve. That uh, you know, as humans age, our brains shrink a little bit. And it's humbling to think about this, but all of our brains start shrinking a little bit after age 30. And so maybe old MS lesions that we accommodated and recovered from um, as we lose neural reserve, maybe those old MS lesions start rearing their ugly head a little bit, just not because the MS has changed, but because we don't have as much reserve uh, CNS function to fall back on. So that could, in theory, you know, result in, in bladder symptoms worsening a little bit just with normal human, human aging. We're trying to push back on that in research. So where research is headed is towards neural repair. So, you know, we, we've not figured out how to stop human aging yet, but hopefully in the foreseeable future, we will have things that would maybe push the clock backwards as it relates to the brain and spinal cord. Okay, so we're coming up um, on our time limit. That's uh, about all the time we have for now. We have um, a, a few more questions that maybe we can answer um, offline. Uh, but that is the time we have for now. And if you missed any part of this conference, it will be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or our YouTube channel. And remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference will be Wednesday, July 15th at 5 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Eugene May. And the topic will be MS and neuroophthalmology. Our sincere thanks uh, for everyone who's attended and your participation, especially to Dr. Thrower. Thank you so much uh, for the time you've spent uh, to prepare and share this information with us. And thanks. Uh, any final thoughts? Thank you guys very much. Everybody stay safe and healthy and looking forward to something closer to normal times when maybe we can have more of these meetings in person. And everybody just take care of yourselves.